Greetings and welcome. My name is Jake Rayson. I'm a wildlife food forest garden designer and today I just wanted to talk about the uh, scented and wildlife and edible plants for a, a small garden, spe specifically the clifftop garden which is a garden I've been working on. Um, yeah, a bit of a bit of a rush, <laughs> bit of a rush day today. Lots going on, so it's all terribly exciting. Um, so let's get this. I haven't got my normal slideshow. Um, so the, just to give you kind of an overview, the garden itself. Hold on a second. I don't want that. The garden itself is a um it's up on it's it's this is for the blue house on the left hand you can just just see the the, the blue house on the left hand side uh, and it's about you know, 12 meters by 10 meters there's a bank where that leylandii was um and there's a bank runs around and then there's a, what, another level where you can see the people with the chainsaws and then there's another level still which is just a bit a, a bit further down so the main garden bit is here and it's quite a small area and access is kind of is kind of quite difficult but that's what the the the, the whole idea is to create a garden which is has scented plants is good for wildlife and has edible plants and really amongst amongst all that it's a refuge it's somewhere to go and get away from everything and be kind of sheltered so what you will find is that you can break things down. This is a, this <laughs> there's a very famous quote which I'll, I'll, I'll try and try and drag out. Um, but as soon as you try and pull one thing out in life, and you try and extract one single thing, you know you you realise that everything is connected to everything else. And you pull out one thing, and it's connected to everything else. And this is exactly what happens in gardening. That you say, oh, I'm just interested in native plants not edibles just what native wildflowers but then you realize an awful lot of native wildflowers are edible likewise uh that that a lot of a lot of native wildflowers are scented and yeah and it kind of cuts across so scented edible native good for wildlife there's an awful lot of overlap so when you're designing something don't get it kind of locked in to I can only design for this one thing. Kind of open yourself up to the idea that there are an awful lot of different, there's, there's an awful lot of overlaps between different types of plants as well. So um, I'm going to get rid of that ugly. Oh, oh there we go. Um, so, yes, yeah, so <clears throat> what I wanted to get to <clears throat> is this idea of an overarching philosophy. It sounds kind of pompous and it sounds a bit up its ass, its own ass. But it's the idea that when you're designing a garden, that you've got to be aware of, of, of the framework that you're designing it in. Yeah, a garden is never, ever just a garden. It's always related to a whole range of other factors. Um, so every garden is an ecological opportunity and uh, this really does apply so much to forest gardens forest gardens function because they are ecosystems because there are nutrients going into the ground which you are growing and there is pest control that you have because you have a developed ecosystem in, a, in an established forest garden you have the pest control already built in yep so it's this kind of overview that wildlife is what you want and the yep so go for that. I've been getting, uh, I've been watching a couple of videos, John Little videos. He's a brownfield gardener in Essex and he's very inspirational. And his point is that there's a diversity of plants is one thing, but also you want to be looking at a diversity of habitat. So it's all very well providing, it's good. No, it is good to provide uh, nectar and pollen for pollinators. But you also need to provide food for the larval stages of those of the pollinators, and you need to provide habitat where those those um, those insects can live. And it is this idea, and I can't remember the quote, but basically provide grow insects, and everything else will come along as well. So you grow plants for insects, create habitats for insects everything else comes along for free pretty much 
and I think it's really, really interesting. It's 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 one of the it's one of the key things that you have control over. I mean, this is the whole idea of control and dominion, which I think is absolutely fascinating. Kind of in exploitation and colonialism, and also in gardens as well. The idea of human, this human centric, human first uh, point of view. But what you can do is use that power for good. You can create habitat and a diversity of diversity of habitat and a diversity of plants and that you can consciously go out and do that at the beginning of creating a garden so i kind of you know and it's a learning process and this is something i'm i, I think everybody's on the, on the learning on the learning path and this is what i'm on so diversity of habitat i wanted to kind of write these down just so i couldn't wouldn't forget them <clears throat> so log piles <clears throat> okay and the other thing about habitats as well is what John Little is very good at. He's very kind of the stuff I've seen of his is very it's it's funny. It's it's very neat and tidy, very geometric. The shapes that he uses, and that is as a counterpoint to the the mess of crushed concrete or crushed brick or crushed ceramics. He puts them, he encloses them, and gives them an edge. So it's a very good way of doing that. So likewise with a log pile, like there is a log pile which I think is going to be <clears throat> is actually quite hidden in, in this garden. But he has a you know you can create a log pile that is quite ornamental, is quite you know artistic. So you can have you can appeal to humans and it can have order. Insects don't care about straight lines. Humans <laughs> humans historically do. For a cultural reasons, uh, but you can if you create straight lines for habitat, then that means that you can that, that you can serve both. You can serve insects and you can serve humans. So it's 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 a way of yeah. Just bear that in mind when you're creating things. So the log pile here is that there are some a lot of old bits of log and stuff and old bits of wood, and I'm piling them down on the second shelf, which is fairly inaccessible. We'll have two we'll have two or three shrubs on it. Uh, a ground cover of periwinkle, the one along here at the bottom, um, and you can see it down here. And the logs will be in a corner, shoved away somewhere in a corner, which is which is fine because that's what they're doing. They're doing their log thing. They're decomposing. They're providing habitat for God, God knows what amphibians and 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 insects and wood wood um, but, uh, insects that eat invertebrates that eat bits of wood wood lice and things like that. So. That's doing its thing. So log pile, really, really, really easy to do. It's a pile of logs, and you could, but you can make it artistic as well. Crushed concrete. So there is a uh, some old bits of concrete left over from when the house was built, and I'm going to put the crushed concrete. You probably you can't really see it from here. I will show a, another picture in a second. Um, crushed concrete is using a variety of different materials, and again, actually incorporating them to the garden. Uh, you can use crushed concrete. There's few plants which will grow in it, but they do grow very well because they don't have much competition. So small scabious and thyme are two of the plants that do very well in crushed concrete. So I've got there's, a, there's going to be a little area of crushed concrete, and I'm putting thyme in there, and it's great because it's crushed concrete is very low nutrient, and there's not uh, not many plants will grow in it. So the thyme does very well because the thyme likes calcareous soils and full sun and good drainage. So it does really well in that, but don't yeah. You know, there are other materials as well. And this is what's kind of again for John Little's work is very exciting. Is that he's he's trying out different different materials, different kind of what we would call waste materials, and then growing well, growing uh, flowers and growing plants in it, and just see what you can come up with. Stone pile. There's a lot of slate around. You can probably see bits of slate down here. And I, again, I'm creating a, a stone, a pile of stones, and then I have uh, there's a native maiden pink Dianthus deltoides, uh, which I'm growing over that so again that's in the full sun area uh, and it provides a, a lot of crevices but again make it look tidy not tidy make it make it look intentional design it create this this stone pile and have plants are going to have a, it's a kind of trailing plant and will grow over it but it creates great habitat thorny shrubs i'm trying to get hold of a uh, barberry berberis vulgaris native barberry uh, again, more habitat, thick hedging. There's privet, a privet hedge, and there's a gelder rose and some willow. At ground cover, uh, yep, there's green strawberry which I've got in, and some lesser periwinkle. So that's kind of providing thick ground cover. And I think this is really what you want to be aiming at. You don't 
don't have bare soil. Initially, there's a lot of bark kicking around. I'm using bark as a temporary mulch. Rarely, with gardens, you want to fill them up. You don't want bare soil. You don't want like any space. You want to cram it full of plants, and that provides good kind of cover. That provides good cover for for for, for wildlife. And, and there's a water bowl possibly, and a mini possibly a, a mini pond in there as well. So there's kind of a diversity of habitat, and you're intentionally creating that diversity of habitat. So with that overview that you're creating, you know, it's a, every garden is an ecological opportunity and whether you're growing a food garden or whether you're growing an ornamental garden, this is your kind of starting point that native plants are an integral part of that. And I've said this, <laughs> I've said this once, I've said it a thousand times. Um, you grow native plants because they have co-evolved with the wildlife, with the native wildlife and generally not like always but things will eat your native plants more they prefer native plants to to non-native plants insects prefer native plants to non-native generally you know, as a kind of general kind of rule of thumb so where you can grow ed grow native plants so you're growing edibles that's great but if you've got hedging consider using native hedging if you've got ground cover consider using native ground cover i mean in this situation i didn't have any i didn't have the budget for native ground cover i had some i had some of my own that i've been using but just generally that's what you want to be aiming for use natives where possible uh, and the other thing was it's the kind of human at the end of the list it's the human the human side of it this is uh scented and edible plants this is what the client asked for was scented plants and there, as i said before there's a huge amount of overlap between them you can have scented plants and and native plants and scented plants and edible plants there's not they're not exclusionary um so yeah so that's that's what i'm gonna be looking at really really important um oh what i will just oh i will just kind of hop over to the where is it gone there it is uh i just want to go oh, <clears throat> I, before kind of getting into that to organize all this um it looks kind of scary it's a spreadsheet spreadsheets look scary but it's actually quite yeah it's like everything it's just a lot of it and it looks complicated but it's not it's not too bad at all i use google sheets google's an evil kind of um, monopoly company uh, but they have very nice online spreadsheets which i can share with a client and the whole purpose of is just to be able to organize the plants that I'm that I've put together and to share that information with the client as well so I'll just run through it there's the name of the plant which is a common name and there's a link to the plants for a future website which plants for a future is a fantastic resource with a load of uh, useful plants kind of it's all about use useful plants and what their uses are and yeah their conditions so that's it's great the botanical name with a list to the plant atlas the biological record center plant atlas um, and then the form so to be able to organize it to see what you've got you can organize it by you know what type is it a climber cover shrub uh, flower what's the what's what form is it and then where it is on the cad on the uh, on the plan the cad map so here you know I've uh, it's really good idea if you start planning stuff and you can do this on paper it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be a cad plan at all um but if you're doing it just just to keep a note keep in your head where things are r name the different areas and then you get an idea of which plant goes in which area yeah just kind of it helps it helps to do it and this can be a list of paper this can be a paper list it doesn't doesn't matter so which bed does it go in and what is it doing and is it a native and how big is it and how many and how much and what's the subtotal and who's supplying it and has it been ordered and has it been delivered and what's the total price my budget for all the plants was a thousand pounds and i've gone over by 170 quid but um yeah but you know it's just good to be able to kind of keep everything in in, in balance and above all really apart from this document um is a reference so that the client when you know i've i've lent the client the uh oh, where's my book gone oh i've got uh, harrop's wildflowers but you can say to the client there you go these are the plants and this is where the plants are and here's the plan so when you're looking after the garden 
this is what you need to look out for and this is more information about the plant and this is how big it grows and da 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 so that this is a kind of document which is actually really really useful for maintenance for the client so i'm really kind of big on using a spreadsheet for a job with this and it's not a big job i mean just in terms of the size of the garden but it is a big job in terms of the amount of work that's gone into it and the the the, the number of plants and the kind of the the design and the thinking about it so it's a big job in that respect but it's a document that can be referred to uh, later on down the line so totally recommend doing that i've got a template if you're interested i've got a template that you can that you can use uh, i don't know what it is off the top of my head um, so an overview of the garden then so structure is really really important in a garden before you, and this is if you're starting off with a philosophy of the this is the it's a wildlife philosophy every garden is an ecological opportunity start off with that mindset and then go down the route and the next thing that you want to do and this is any garden is you want to look at the structure of a garden how is that garden going to be used gardens are where people generally meet nature it's like a place for people to interact and to to explore to to be outside and to to create and i think it's really really important to you know bear that in mind it got, you can't have a garden without people and you can't have people without a garden you, know, you need to have both together and the gardens where a garden is where this this happens so they're kind of very important places for that reason and so this you need to get the structure right this is the this is the this is the kind of key is how will that garden be used what is the space how will it be used what's it for what are pe how people are going to do it i heard a story uh, a, a beautiful story um there was the national forest gardening scheme had a, had a series of seminars a couple of years ago and one was about forest gardens in a health setting and somebody had created a forest garden i think it was in manchester at a, at a hospital the kidney unit to the hospital and the it was just like a scrap of land it was just like really awkward between two car parks sloped and you know it was it was that forgotten land and somebody even created the forest garden put a bench in there and put some plants in and it was just like a really beautiful little space and the patient was using the garden um but and, and they had terminal kidney disease and that's where they went every day and it was just like this is what gardens are about this is you know this is that sums it up for me so this space is about a refuge this is the kind of this is the idea about this space is that it's um this is the garden that they have it's not a massive garden it's kind of off the road and it's got a view down the valley so the idea is to create a refuge and to create shelter and privacy so there is let me see if i can find it here so along the front for example just kind of just 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 to get kind of set the scene Along the front, there is a post and rail he uh, post and rail fence going in, and and that provides kind of privacy as well. The plants being planted at the front as well, and that's kind of shielding it from the front. And then from on on this side down here, just about see them. There's there's a small one and a half meter high hedge, and that will just sh shield from the windows here, and that will provide some privacy from that windows from those windows. And then the hedging there's a um, line here of bowls willow hybrid so very upright growing very fast growing um kind of very you know they, they grow to about six to eight meters and they're one and a half meter diameter uh that it is uh, the idea is to get that get that like get that space filled because there is a uh you know there's a garage and just it's to sh it's to block off the the get the view from the garage yep so that it provides privacy from that angle and then likewise along the other side there's gelder rose and the, and the cherry tree and uh the, the witch hazel and an amelanchia um and again that's to provide some cover from from the house at the top not so much of an issue so it's about in, mostly the, the hedges here are about privacy and and providing a sense of secu seclusion and the fencing at the front is as well and where this great big pile of concrete is that's where the pergola is going I'm like where's my pergola oh this is this is not the pergola that's going in but a pergola is going in in here a round wood pergola and um and putting in benches as well so there's um this is a bench there's a chap called david uh, 
David. Obviously, can't have a David. I can't remember his surname. A uh, brilliant, brilliant guy. Uh, he does these round wood uh, benches and pergolas, and he's great. He's he's. I really like. I really like his work, and I really like his outlook. And he's kind of creating a couple of benches um, uh, for the site as well. So you want seating areas, and a, a, and there's a pergola. So this is all the structure. This is kind of this is what you're thinking about is hedging and and seating and fencing and 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 buildings and ponds and all that kind of stuff. And that's going to get that again getting the path right. And the reason for the path being wiggly is really to to break it up to be able to put the hedges in to put the shrubs there's shrubs here and there's a shrub here and there's a shrub here and it breaks up the the line of view if you had a straight path from the house straight to the pergola it would just be like oh that's the garden whereas fingers crossed the hedges will grow the roses will grow and they'll put a screen and you've got to go around and then you've got to come back around again and you've got to go around so you're actually using most of the space and what is really fascinating is that you look an awful lot more i mean i've i've been up and down that path a hundred thousand times and you will look at the space an awful lot more because you're being forced to go around it because you're you know you're changing direction you're looking down the valley and then you're looking at the pergola and then you're looking at the back of the house and so it's it's it's, it's great it actually it's it's so funny you don't even think about it. you're not even aware of it but you get people to move and then they start exploring whereas if you give someone a straight path then there's no incentive for them to, to to look around differently um and this is no this is a very common thing to do in a small garden is to provide a path which does that because you're using all the all the available space um there's a fantastic woman a gardener at uh the botanic garden wales daryl daryl little um who's left now unfortunately um and she's brilliant she showed me around the japanese garden i was designing a japanese a kind of a you know this concept ideas for a japanese garden for a client in poland and she showed me around the japanese garden and it's got a path it's got a wiggly path and it's she was talking about the the idea that you take your time on the wiggly path to get to your destination it's all about let's just calm down a bit let's go to the gun and it gives you time to contemplate it's not like a must get here from here to here as quickly as possible it's the opposite of that so yeah i'm very very happy with the structure of this and the, the space we've got uh, and that's the tapestry lawn about which more later um okay let me just have a quick look so that's the that that's the structure sorry so blah, 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 blah. hedging privacy steps yeah i'm putting steps in as well for access um okay now now i wanted to talk about the plants the kind of shrubs and the trees so <clears throat> this is the the kind of focal point so where this photograph is taken from well actually no just before the photograph like just down here actually there is a strawberry tree well it's not it's still in the pot because they they're still the the, the ollie the landscape is putting the piles in and stuff um uh, the strawberry tree is going in here and that's a kind of focal point it's an evergreen tree beautiful bark kind of reddish bark and it grows tree shrub five six meters it has lovely white creamy white flowers and it has the most amazing red fruit and because of the way that that and, it, and it's a great it does really well actually likes full sun but it's very good at stabilizing soil so it's an ideal spot for it and it's got edible berries and the flowers and the berries are on the tree at the same time um early i think early early spring i think and those are the berries um yeah they're just incredible and you can and they're edible as well so it's a yeah it's not a native but it is um, it is a kind of specimen tree, and that's the tree that you'll see. It'll be above the pergola, so really like, really, really like that. Uh, just yeah, just a, a gorgeous, gorgeous plant. And then on the oh, can I do that? Oh, okay. Oops, sorry. Yeah. So um, I'm just gonna do. Uh, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Oh, come on, come on there we go sorry i just wanted to get two windows up so i can flip between them <laughs> yeah so that i wouldn't get distracted yeah 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 
Right. Bogues Willow. Um, Martin Crawford uses it a lot. He uses it as a windbreak and uh, it grows incredibly fast. Very easy to grow. Uh, I've got a load of cuttings out in the garden. So as replacements and also, yeah, because of things, it's always a good idea to get more than you need, particularly if you get, you're growing from cuttings. Um, on here, I uh, planted it mostly down here and I put the, just I just put the cutting straight to the ground and most of them you know they should they should take and they will grow very fast so they're kind of a good way they're a good way of uh, they're a really really good windbreak uh, if you want a six to eight meter high windbreak uh, so that they're, 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 they're fantastic they're a viminalis salix viminalis cross so the root structures are quite restrained they won't they won't disrupt any kind of um, the, the, the wall or anything because they're quite compact um, so that 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 they're 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 great and very exciting. And then down at the front, oh, I was going to put cornice in. Yeah, I love cornice. The um, I love cornice generally. You know, there's a uh, there's native cornice, which is blood. Oh, what's it called? Uh, cornice. It's cornice. It's cornice sanguinea. Uh, uh, and oh, I've got. Oh well, I have got a native cornice in there as well. Oops, sorry. Yeah, down at the front, down right down here, there is a uh, native cornice, and I put a couple of native. I'm putting a couple of native uh, cornice into. This is a cornice cusa. There's cornice cusa galaxy, or is it Milky Way? Get Milky Way, cornice cusa Milky Way, and just these stunning kind of bracts. Um, that's the flower in the middle, um, and these are the kind of the bracts, and they're just absolutely yeah, they're just incredible. So really, really like that. And that one of those is going down at the front. Uh, edible berries like a sheltered sheltered sun part shade um, again not a native but I do have it's Gelderose Viburnum opulus uh, and there are uh, cultivars which have been bred from the uh, Gelderose can be used as a hedging plant or can be used as a specimen and they're at, they're just a beautiful beautiful tree I mean the, the, the native on un, un, unbred one has kind of flat flowers oh yeah they're just glorious glorious flowers and i don't think you need to you don't need to get the double there's a whole lot of kind of pom-poms and everything don't get them because kind of pollinators can't access them uh, any kind of double flowers makes it much harder for a wider range of pollinators have them if you can get the native and get a sing, uh, the single um flowers yep so and i and it's a great and it's got glorious berries as well and glorious autumn color so just a fantastic all-round plant can be used as a specimen. It can be used in hedging. I have it is uh, kind of as a mix between specimen between a hedging plant and a standalone plant. I've got one kind of here. Uh, they grow to about five meters tall. Um, and then Ligustrum vulgare is a wild privet, UK native, and that's going in the front here. Semi evergreen. I've uh, been looking around we've got we've got one here actually in, my, in our own garden and they will keep in, in a sheltered sunny spot they will keep their their foliage uh, through winter uh, which is good and this is like a sheltered sunny spot so that will provide kind of permanent screening uh, um, from the from the garage so that's that, that, that's like a really and a really lovely plant as well and they're kind of scented they've got a, quite a strong smell <laughs> so yeah they're scented too and then on to the scent, um, Daphne, I, would say I don't know much at all about all traditional ornamental plants, not really my thing, uh, and they, but the client loves them and there's there's a there's a Daphne in there and she'll, she'll get some more as well, kind of small shrub, one and, I think it's about one and a half metres high, um, let's have a look, yeah, oops, yeah it's one metre by one metre. Um, and that's going in down uh, down over just just down there I think it is so that's yeah that's really exciting um, and roses oh I mean you gotta love oh, I was after a, I can't remember which rose it was it's a beautiful I like this this is rose rose hollow car and uh, there was another one I was trying a bit more open a bit redder um, but it's still still lovely. So I've got three of those. At, you know, that's the kind of centerpiece, and they're down here next to the house, next to the path. So if they take off, they'll be just absolutely gorgeous. Um, lovely scent, lovely, lovely scented. They've bought them from David Austin, so um, they're kind of kind of very good quality, very expensive, <laughs> but very much worth it. Uh, and then 
the I wanted to show you this one first of all. This is um, Tarentum myrtle, which is related to the native Myrtus communis, common myrtle, but is a subspecies and it's kind of shorter. And the reason I got that was because just down here, that's where it's it's the one and a half meter high hedge. Don't really want anything taller because that'll start to shade out other things. Um, the green as well. So we've got the evergreen wild privet here, and then the evergreen myrtle here. And then that will provide screening from the house. So that's that's the kind of idea behind that. And it is kind of a native. It's not really native native, but it is almost kind of native, a near native, which is good. Um, and oh yeah, just just and then then, then uh, uh, there's a rosemary. There's got lavender. This is rosemary Tuscan blue, and it's a big old plant. And that's I think that's at the front there, and that will fill the space. That really really well. Might have to move something around. We'll see glorious glorious plant and, and just so nice putting planting a rosemary is gorgeous gave it i dug down deep and gave it a load of grit horticultural grit along the along its kind of root run along the, the base of it and then put in the soil so it's, it's pretty good drainage actually because it's on there's a big old slope going down so it's not bad at all for drainage but i did add some extra grit in there too i just don't want it to sit in you don't want uh, any kind of mediterranean plants you don't want them sitting in uh, with their roots in, in water and cold damp roots that they'll they'll keel over so hopefully full sun should really really love it there and a glorious smell when i was planting it too just really really good and do remember as well that the kind of scent that you have this is moroccan mint it's not always about in your face there's flowers on the there's flowers on the tree uh, on, on on the plant and that's the scent that you're getting it's also you can the leaves as well so i've got a bog myrtle in there uh, which has beautifully fragrance leaves which you can use in cooking and this is Moroccan mint, which um, I've tried to persuade the client to make make cups of tea um, in the in the pergola. Uh, but it's just like a really lovely, it's a really tactile, lovely plant and very scented because it's it's a mint, so it's great. And then the other feature as well is the tapestry lawn. Now, uh, this is where I'm saying about scent, native plants, and kind of the function of a plant. This area, this mulched area down here, that's where the tapestry lawn is going. And what I've done is uh, Lionel, oh, what's his name? He's got the, the book about tapestry lawns. Tapestry lawns have got a lot of work um, and they're quite expensive because there's a lot of plants that, you know, it's it's not just throwing grass seed down and then looking after the lawn. It's what people know. This It's, it's more... A, a kind of a mosaic of plants a tapestry of plants uh and looking after them and, and keeping them mown but um there is a mowing regime for them but it's way way less maintenance and also i've plumped for native plants it's predominantly native plants anyway but i, I kind of like have, i'm not using non-native so the tapestry one i've created is native plants that like full sun and yeah it's they're 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 also uh, scent, an awful lot of them are scented as well. So you walk on them, uh, then you'll get some scent when you, when you when you kind of walk about on the tapestry lawn. So you see, there's native plants, there's scent, uh, and there's a kind of function of a lawn. So it's this, and there's the the visual appeal of it as well. So this is where things cross over. In permaculture terms, you call this uh, stacking functions. But yeah, things doing more than one thing. Um, and then cut last couple just very quickly there's a uh, um oh good god it's a winter flowering honeysuckle lanicera fragrantissimi uh smells gorgeous and it's getting sent across different times of the years as well and this is the key i think for any kind of flowers or any 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 scented garden and a flower garden is having scent throughout the year so i've got mahonia aquifolium apollo down at the front of the uh, down at the front of the house uh, so when you walk past the house in the in the in the uh, early spring, that's what you're going to smell. And when you walk into the garden at winter time, that's what you're going to smell. And then in the summer, you're going to get the roses. And um, in the winter, you get the witch hazel and the uh, winter flowering honeysuckle. In the spring, you get the wild privet. So you have you got a kind of <laughs> seasonal interest. What a horrible phrase! But you get you know you get it to work across the whole of the year. And then the other centre plant, I've got Witch Hazel Diane, uh, which is gorgeous. Lovely, lovely. I've always wanted to have a Witch Hazel. I haven't, I haven't got one here. 
um, and then on to the native plants and again native plants you know they really kind of really can be really really good pollinators um, but they can also they're also very beautiful in their own right they're not necessarily the showiest of plants but I don't think it's about the showiness it does uh, people don't want them kind of neon colors that is beautiful that's uh, Stachys sylvatica hedge wound work um, and they've honestly bumblebees go bonkers for them they really really do we've got I can't remember what else we've got up there. Hedge wound work. We've got we've got a couple of these up by the up by the summer house, and the bees go crazy for it, and they'll prefer it to anything else. Um, and that's that's not data. That's um, what you call it. It's uh, it's my just my personal experience. And hemp agrimony, big kind of big plant, a again native, again beautiful in its own right. And same with knapweed and uh, meadow sweet. And then it, this is whoopsie. Where are you? Oh, where you've gone? Natweed, sorry, meadow sweet. So meadow sweet, another example, native plant likes uh, damp, um, shade, part shade, uh, flowers later on in the summer. Glorious, I mean, just like really rich, musky smell, just fantastic smell, fantastic fragrance, and covered in insects. And again, you can you can use them as flavoring. Uh, they're, they're edible, uh, the flowers. I had one in the vodka and tonic last summer. It's very nice. So it's, you know, it's got beautiful flowers. It's it's a well, the, the great pollinator. It's a, you know, it's 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 edible, and it's the same thing. So you, you can have the crossover. So this is what I'm trying to get at: is you don't. It's not about one thing. It's about having everything. Having your gardening cake and eat it. Same thing: musk mallow, Malva muscata, edible, beautiful, native. Sweet Sicily, edible, beautiful, native, yep, yarrow, ed not edible, <laughs> useful, knit your bones with it, break your bones, use yarrow, native, yep, so you kind of get the idea. And then when you do come to the edible stuff, I mean, there are things which are specifically bought, this is, I, I couldn't find a photo of it, it's Aronia arbutifolia, I think this is, there's a few types, different species of Aronia, Aronia bush, fantastic berries, nice, much nicer cooked, I like cooking with them. Um, so just like having a couple of those in your garden, you can get quite small ones. I've got Aronia Brilliance, really lovely, really, really kind of glorious plant. Uh, great autumn colour, native to North America, but it's not like the whole garden is filled with non-native. This is like there's a couple of bushes around which are specifically, you know, for the berries. So there's um, the black currant, uh, Ben Hope, and then there's Aronia, and I've got a blueberry as well. Uh, but there's, uh, you know, things like the um, Barbary, the Berberis vulgaris, European Barbary. Reading a book last night about walled gardens and the Barbary, before uh, lemons were common, Barberies were used throughout uh, British cooking as a uh, as a sour flavour. Crikey, crikey. There's that. There we go. So, so you it, and it's a native and it's great habitat because it's got spiny, it's a spiny bush and it has a beautiful fragrance. So I think Barbary is a brilliant, brilliant plant to end on because it just showcases the fact that you can have something which is edible, uh, fragrant, uh, <laughs> loved by wildlife, pollinators, and it's and for habitat and for eating the leaves, and yes, it's it's and it's a, it's a very very beautiful plant as well. So, yep, there we go. This is the cut. This is the kind of this is the kind of plant that I like. <laughs> but it's all together. Get everything all together. So hope you enjoyed that. Um, thank you very much for watching. There is a uh, that that that's brilliant. I'll just say goodbye now. Thank you for watching. See you again next next month on my regular monthly live stream. And I've got a workshop next Monday. Okay. Cheers and bye.